before we start the review, this video is brought to you by no one. I don't have a sponsor. Give me your money. Just an Elysian Tale. Uh, you know, I'm actually glad this was requested. I downloaded this game, I think, through PlayStation Plus years ago, and just never got around to playing it, which is admittedly something that tends to happen with PlayStation Plus games. Now, despite its age, I've managed to go in relatively blind. I knew nothing about the game, the genre, the story, nothing really. Well. Okay, I, I mean, I did know it was released on most systems that were available. Being published initially on the Xbox 360, it would go on to be released on Steam, PlayStation 4, iOS, Nintendo Switch, calculators, and, well, there's no time like the present, is there? So, let's not delay any further and dive straight in, shall we? And I hope it's good, for your sake, Paramite. The world of dust is called Falana, a bright and vibrant world inhabited by anthropomorphic animals and creatures. However, this land has been ravaged by the empirical General Gaius, whose campaign of war has led to the near extinction of a race known as the Moonblood. Any sympathizers are also cut down without question. The titular dust awakens in a meadow with no recollection of his past or how he found himself here. He is discovered by a sentient blade known as Ara, followed closely by the sword's guardian, Fidget, a small winged creature known as a nim bat. A nim- A nim bat? With the guidance of Ara and Fidget, Dust will journey across the land of Falana, changing the lives of the people he meets and doing good deeds, all whilst unsure of his own past and the horrors he may or may not have committed. What you'll notice very quickly is this game is brimming with colour and personality. While some might not like the digital art style, I actually feel the opposite. It certainly helps the game stand out artistically anyway. I was getting some serious deviant art vibes throughout my playthrough, which isn't something you hear me say very often, and that is not a negative. In this instance, it's actually quite the positive. That's great! If anything, it made me think of the likes of Rayman Legends, particularly in terms of the background art, which is quite the compliment. And the game is bookended by these stylish animations at the beginning of each chapter. And overall, there's a surprising amount of polish, particularly when you consider that this was predominantly made by one person. Dean Dodrill. I, I hope I'm, I'm... Am I saying that right? I, oh God, I hope I'm saying that right. I'm sorry, Dean. He did have some help from Alex Kane with the story, whilst also outsourcing the sound and music, as well as the voice acting heard throughout the game. But everything else, the arts, the gameplay, yeah, that was, that, that was, that was him. That was, that was him. One, one person, one, one very talented, talented bastard did all, did all this. There, there's, there's me making this little video, and then there's this guy who has the talent to design and program and create a game world, almost single-handedly. What a talented git. In short, the game world is vibrant with great looking characters and some nice animation to go along with it. Plus a story that isn't as predictable as you might be thinking. But what about the aforementioned sound? Let's take a look. Well, a, a, a look? No, it, it'd be more of a listen. It'd be, yeah, it'd be, it'd be more of a, ignore me, I'm an idiot. The combat portions of the game are rather long, so thankfully the soundtrack doesn't become tiresome. In fact, most of the time it's pretty damn good and absolutely complements the experience. I'm not sure that much of it would be something you'd listen to outside of the game, but it's not intrusive and absolutely does the job. Plus, it was handled by Hyperduck Soundworks and Alexander Brandon, the latter of which has worked on games such as Unreal Tournament and Deus Ex. The original sound effects are also good, with impactful sounding attacks which help enhance the combat, from the slashing and crashing of attacks to the more subtle sounds of dust spinning armor around and returning to a combat stance. 
it can get a smidgen chaotic at times, but I'm pretty sure that's intentional. The voice acting is pretty solid as well, actually. I don't recognise any of the voices, but they all fit the characters for the most part and wouldn't seem out of place in any other game. Unfortunately, the dialogue can be drowned out by sound effects at times, literally in the case of talking to Lady Tethys underneath Mudpot Village. The waters have stopped flowing. I was the one to stop Be careful, Dust. I do not believe she's used to being spoken to so casually. And that's not the only issue I had with the audio mixing. Towards the end of the game, some of the sound effects are far too loud. I had to turn my volume all the way down because of these explosion and rumble sound effects. It's so weird because the audio mixing in the game is pretty damn good for the most part, so I'm unsure whether it's like this in all versions or if it's just something that might have happened with the PlayStation 4 port. So it looks great and the sound design is pretty good, but more importantly, how does it play? The main thing you'll find yourself doing in Dust is traversing large areas, battling a multitude of different creatures, acquiring loot, completing quests, and battling boss characters. The combat is particularly slick with fast and responsive gameplay, with some easy to pull off combos available to the character from the very beginning. As you progress, however, you acquire new abilities such as being able to slide on the ground, dodge roll, double jump, with Fidget also acquiring new spells as well. The combo chain system encourages you to attempt to string together a large amount of hits, as the higher your chain is, the larger amount of bonus experience you will gain. Waiting too long to strike again or being hit yourself will break this chain, with the latter outright removing the bonus experience. Unfortunately, you never actually acquire any new combos for Aura, but to balance this, there is a leveling system that allows you to customise dust stats as you see fit. Hey, you just leveled up! And there are four stats to choose from your health, attack, defence, and fidget. Uh, yeah, it, it makes sense. Just trust me, it makes sense. Realistically, you could create an absolute glass cannon and attempt to plow through enemies and dodge roll to avoid hits, or go a more defensive route with Fidget's magic potency higher. And with Fidget's magic, you can actually combine it with one of your regular attacks to create these really explosive and powerful joint attacks. On top of the leveling up system, there are also plenty of items to acquire, such as healing items, rings, amulets, weapon damage enhancers, armor, plus materials that are dropped by enemies. You can either purchase these items from this creepy merchant here, or craft them when you acquire the blueprints and the necessary materials that enemies drop. Speaking of the merchant, this guy continues to pop out throughout Dust's adventures, not too dissimilar to our favourite British merchant from Resident Evil 4. Ah, you'll buy them at a high price. There's actually a cool mechanic here in terms of the materials you can purchase from him. He will always be without the raw materials and items that are found in new areas, the ones dropped by enemies. But if you sell them to him, not only will you make a decent and tasty profit, he will then eventually be able to have these items in stock, which can really, really help you later on down the line when you are desperately in need of that one material to craft that sexy new piece of armor. It's a really nice system, and I don't really think I've seen it that often in games like this. I could be wrong. The map system is exactly what you would expect from a Metroidvania game like this. Areas are displayed as squares on the map, with icons that tell you if there's a save point, merchant, or treasure in that area, with opened treasures marked accordingly. Plus, if you're ever unsure of where you need to go next, it's actually marked on the map with a flag, which is really helpful for someone stupid like me. Chests require a key, with the player having to then pass a minigame before opening the container to get the goodies within. You'll also find these cages with multiple locks. Within these cages are friends, which are actually references and characters from other games, such as the Spelunker from Spelunky. They're not just nice easter eggs either. Each of them give you a permanent bonus to your stats, such as a 5% increase to your hit points. And something else that's really cool is that the game utilises a parry system which was genuinely surprising. More so the fact that it's very, very generous and gives you a large window of time to pull it off. To do so, you swing your weapon just before an enemy strikes and then hold down the attack button. It's that simple and it is essential against certain enemies. If, the, if there's one small issue I have with the game, it's that the, the combat sections of the game sometimes feel too large. The combat areas just seem to drag on at times. Definitely not a deal breaker, but it's, it's a 
just that slight issue I had with it. Thankfully, the game isn't just non-stop action, as there are a few towns to visit, such as Aurora and Mudpot Village. The latter of which has characters with, bizarrely, what someone could mistake for, generic Texan slash Southern American accents. It's really weird. I think I'd remember seeing a talking, flying weasel cat thing down here. I think we got off on the wrong foot here. In these towns, you'll be able to stock up on items, talk to characters, and acquire side quests. And the game does slow down considerably when you enter these towns, but in fairness, it does break up the action and stops the game from becoming tiresome. There's a lot of dialogue in these villages though, so be prepared to sit there and listen to or read a lot of text. But if you are impatient and just want to kill things, then you can skip all the dialogue and cutscenes and just plow through the game. Although you will miss out on some cool plot threads. Getting back to the bosses that I mentioned previously, they... <sighs> okay, this is a problem. They are honestly pretty easy. Except for General Gaius, who is easily the toughest enemy in the game, which is fitting. He absolutely should be. He's the final boss. The difficulty of the latter is further strengthened by the prolonged combat section before you face him, where you'll find yourself using up a lot of healing items. Personally, for me, this extended battle sequence was my least favourite part of the game. Here you are taking the fight to the forces of General Gaius alongside the remnants of the Moonblood forces, and unfortunately its execution is less exciting and more, well, frustrating. This, in short, is due to the chaotic nature of it, and while that is a great way to show the fight as a whole and the chaos of war, it's not particularly fun to play, as you'll find yourself getting lost amongst your allies and unable to focus on attacking your enemies. More often than not, I was getting hit and unsure of who or what had hit me, and the best way to clear this part is to utilise your combination attacks with Fidget, but this just adds more to an already cluttered screen. I couldn't wait for this part to be over, it's, it's a great idea, but just... Not so good in execution. But at the end, you do get to kick Geiss' teeth down his throat, so... Uh, yeah, all is forgiven. Yeah, all is forgiven, sod it. In conclusion, Dust and Elysian Tale is a charming and enjoyable Metroidvania game. The combat is slick and responsive, with plenty of fun combos to mess around with and plenty of large areas to explore, characters to interact with, decent soundtrack that complements the gameplay, and a story that throws a few surprising twists at the player. And despite the issues I have with some of the larger areas and that final extended battle sequence, I can't hate on it that much, and that's not just because this game was mostly made by one person. No, it's because because the rest of the experience was so enjoyable. Sure, there's a few niggling issues here and there, but they don't detract enough away from the positives. If you're a fan of Metroidvania style games and you haven't already played Dust, then you should absolutely check it out. I had a blast with it. The game is a perfect length as well. I think it took me about seven or eight hours to wrap things up before the game outstayed its welcome. So thanks again to Paramite1 for requesting this on my Twitch channel. And if you haven't done so already, do go and give me a follow so you can watch me freak out at horror games and if you wish, request a film or game review yourselves. But until next time, stay safe and I will catch you all later.